All right, we'll make a start. We'll call this meeting to order July 16, 2018. So with that, we will move to the uh, 1.2 on the agenda, the Pledge of Allegiance. And it's to the right, you oh sneaky dog. <laughs> <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good night. <clears throat> Okay, uh, we have an agenda in front of us. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Thank you. Anderson and Berg, great. Any discussion on the agenda? Okay. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Fantastic. Okay, uh, communication and recognition, open forum, and seeing the sign from Dr. O'Connell, we are none. All right, so moving on. Our consent agenda, as usual, a number of items in there. Um, uh, nothing uh, significant, but uh, any, do you have a motion for the agenda, please, or the consent agenda? So moved. Thank Second. you. Second. All right. Uh, Ross and Meyer, any discussion on the consent agenda? Everyone good with that? Good. All in, fo all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Fantastic. Okay, we're ticking them off. All right, recommended action. First item today is open enrollment. David. Good evening, board. Um, based on the data presented for criteria for closing to open enrollment at our last board meeting, it is the recommendation of administration to set an enrollment cap of 35 for the Steps Toward Adult Responsibility Program for the 18-19 school year and then close that program to open enrollment if we reach that cap. Any questions? Okay. okay. All right, um, before we get into that, let's, do we have a motion um, for this open enrollment? So moved. Thank you. A second? second. Great, Anderson and Logue. Okay, uh, there was quite a bit of discussion on this um, at the last uh, meeting. Um, this is the CAP program. It's the only, um, only program that we're restricting. Star program. Star program. Star program. program. Sorry. Yep. No, yeah. Sorry. Correct. Thank you. So, any uh, on further reflection, any other questions? Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Um, then we will bring it to a vote. All in favor of the open enrollment proposal, please say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Great. Thank you. Easy peasy. Thank you, David. Okay, now we have a resolution, uh, item 4.2, the election of the school board and calling the school district general election. So Caroline. Yeah, that's me. So we're, um, tonight I'm just bringing the, the mm -hmm. resolution to um, basically um, uh, notify the county auditor of our election and for our school board um, members, we have four seats open coming this November 6th. So um, if we have a motion in the second, we all can answer any questions if you have any, and then we'll go with the roll call. Great. Do I have a motion? So moved. Great. Second. Meyer Logue. Awesome. Okay. This is very procedural. <laughs> this is normal course. Every two years we do this. Mm -hmm. So anything different this time around? Nothing different. Nothing different. No. And what is the, is it still $2? $2 filing $2. fee. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Don't forget to bring your $2. Exactly. $2. So any questions, board members, on this? Again, straightforward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Resolution, you'll make the roll. We need a motion and a second first. Didn't we just... Oh, I'm sorry. You did. I'm yep. not. Thank you. For once... You're, you're right. For once, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for once, let it be known, Tim Klein was beyond reproach. You are right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when I call your last name, please. You're so used to yes me missing no. that. I know. <laughs> That's on me. So no. I'm learning. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to start with Meyer. Yes. Ross. Yes. Anderson. Yes. Berg. Yes. Logue. Yes. And Klein. Yes. And the resolution's adopted and passes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Carolyn. You're welcome. 
Okay, <clears throat> reports. We have some uh, great reports tonight. So let's start with 5.1, which is uh, the report, the annual report on enrollment. So next come to David and Dee Dee. Okay, good evening. So as you know, we typically have provided this report in around the February time frame, but given that we had Davis Demographics do a study for us, we wanted to wait till that was complete so we could have the most current information that matches up with that report. So tonight, David's going to go through a number of charts that look similar to what you've seen in the past. He has a little added features and some other data for you to help answer some questions that you might have. So I'll turn it over to David. Good, thank you. So very similar to our report from last year, and last year, if you recall, we, we took a stab at creating a 10-year history, um, and what we're going to be looking at is enrolled students, so those students that are actually enrolled and served in Eastern Carver County Schools, and we t look at a, a few slides that talk about our resident students. So we'll, of all of the students that are residents of Eastern Carver County Schools, where are they being served, Eastern Carver County Schools or elsewhere? Then we take a little bit different look at that through ADM, so that's more of a budgetary perspective, uh, the daily membership and how is uh, budget impacted by our students that roll into us or that our students enroll out. Finally, we'll take a look at capture rate, so of all of those residents that are in the district, how many of them are we serving, that capture rate that we're trying to monitor trends for. Um, we'll also look uh, very briefly at special populations, EL populations, uh, our ethnicity. And then finally, uh, one last slide that we'll take from Davis Demographics is our projected resident student enrollment. So we'll just walk through all of those, um, give you a little bit of information, again, similar to last year. So we got rid of one year and added the new year, so you have a 10-year look at that. We're just looking for trends over time. And then at the end, we'll see if you have any questions. Great. So just a few reminders as we look at the data. Remember, all of our enrollment data, we pull from an October 1st time frame. At any given time when we pull October 1 data, it still can be changed unless it's all been audited and finalized. So if we're talking about 15-16 data, 16-17 data, we're fine, but even today our 17-18 data might still be updated as, dif as districts are looking at their final enrollment numbers, graduation numbers, and they so it's a point in time. Um, average daily membership at the end of the school year, it's the full-time equivalency of students and it's the basis for most of our funding. So when we do the ADM view of the enrollment information, that's what you'll be seeing. So first slide overall, our October 1 enrollment by year, so again on October 1st, these are the students that Eastern Carver County has been serving for the past 10 years. You'll see we've increased by 915 students in that 10 year time frame, which is about a 10.6% enrollment increase. <coughs> this breaks that down a little bit. So K through 12 in the first row shows you that same number, but we were looking at the change, an increase or decrease in enrollment year over year, and then a percentage. And then interesting looking, interestingly looking at our kindergartners and grade 12, and I'll point out early on, and we're going to see this on other slides as well, uh, a new trend about that high number of students in kindergarten, not only the high number, raw number, but the capture rate that we're trying to increase with our kindergarten students. So students enrolled, the way we break that down a little bit further is we have resident students who are enrolled in the district and that we serve, and then there are students who come to us through enrollment options. So on this slide, you'll see all of the blue. This current school year, 9,176, are residents of ours and we serve, but you'll see that 397 students were open enrolled to us from other districts. In this particular slide, I thought it interesting in 2009 through 10 through about 15, 16, that stayed pretty stable from 250 to 276. But last year we saw a jump of about 50 students and this year we saw a jump of about 70 students. So a new trend, at least for the last two years, maybe the number of students that are open enrolling into our district is increasing, something we just want to continue to keep an eye on. If we break that down a little bit further and instead look at all of the students that we served in the past school year by grade, it might be interesting to take a look at by grade, where are all of those students? How many of them are resident students and how many of them are open enrolled? And when you look at this slide, you can see that 
um, there are, there's a larger number of students that are open enrolled at the high school level. Again, by year, this time if we talk about adding our total residents and then looking at the number of students who are served, depicted on this graph year over year, you can see that there are 12,000 in the current school year or past school year, 12,140 residents, and of those we served 9,176. Total residents increased by 977 students over 10 years, and the residents enrolled in Eastern Carver County Schools increased by 705 students over the past 10 years. You see those lines look like they're at about the same arc or trajectory, um, and we'll look at that a little bit more deeply. It, it really translates to the capture rate. What percentage of our students are we capturing over time? So then if we dive a little bit deeper, because we know that there are residents that we're not serving, we might ask ourselves, where are those students going? So this slide starts to pile them all together with our non-public. So of our resident students that we are not serving, they may choose to attend non-public schools. You'll see those as the blue bar, and that has been a decreasing trend over the last 10 years. Some of our students attend other public schools. You see that as the red portion of the bar. That has been increasing over the last 10 years. Some of our students attend charter schools, also increasing over the last 10 years. And then homeschool is the last portion at the top of each bar, orange, and that has been relatively stable over the last 10 years. Here's a different look at it on a line graph to show those trajectories that I was just talking about. Non-public in blue, decreasing over the last nine years specifically other public schools increasing during that time, and then charter and homeschool, a much smaller number. Again, our resident students, if they're not being served by us, who are they being served by? So then if we dive a little bit deeper and we wanted to look at grade by grade in a particular year instead of 10 years of history, what are we seeing in terms of students that we are serving as well as students that we are not serving. So blue are all of the students that are being served in the last school year by Eastern Carver County Schools. Red is non-public, and you see green is other public, charter is purple, and homeschool is yellow. Again, I will point out, I find an interesting trend at kindergarten and first grade, where we're serving a larger percentage of our resident students. And based on what we learned from our demographic study, the word they use is um, mortality. If we keep our students from grade level to grade level as they move through the system, what we would hope to see over time is our overall capture rate. If we can maintain those trends, we capture them at an early age, the mortality from grade level to grade level stays high, and overall we increase our capture rate and we serve more and more of our resident students. Two years of trend data that we want to continue to monitor as we move forward. So this slide attempts to just summarize then of the students that we lose and of the students that we gain, what is the net outcome of that over that 10 year history? I think one of our concerns maybe is we lose more and more students. True, we've lost a few more students every year, but we've also increased the number of students coming into our district. So the orange line shows the net of that. And you'll see that we've varied over the last 10 years from 2,484 students up to a high of 2,605. I think that's about uh, 127 students as a range. So in the last 10 years, yes, we lose students, but we also get students in, but the range has been within 127. Our net has not been significantly different over that time. Another way of looking at that year over year, so this is an early look at our capture rate. The students that we are serving is the blue bar and the percentage that goes along with that. You'll see the raw numbers at the bottom and then the percentages. And then the raw or the red bar is the enrolled out. Again, you'll see what I think is a pretty tight range. 
the low at 75.7% uh, of our students being served, the highest capture rate in the last 10 years overall at 76.3%. So not a very significant range from year to year in our overall percentages. So if we break some of that down a little bit further, we've talked about where our students that are residents might be served. But if you wanna dive a little bit deeper into that and you look at just homeschool year over year, you can see the number of students who have been choosing homeschooling as their educational option for the last 10 years. The next slide is our charter school students. Again, we saw on our trend line that that had been increasing. So you can see those raw numbers here. The next slide is the other public schools. We saw that on the trend line increasing over the last 10 years. So these are the raw numbers. And we saw that our non-public schools have been decreasing in enrollment. Again, we saw that in the trend line, but if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper, these are the raw numbers. So if we transition to talking a little bit then about ADMs and what that means budgetarily and how many ADMs, residents, but they go somewhere else, but they carry ADMs with them, where are they going? So of our ADMs going out, we looked at the four largest to give you an indication of what's been happening. So you'll see 10 years of history. Your blue bars will be Cologne Academy, 2008 or nine when they started up to a place in 2016-17, the last school year, when they had the most significant ADM from our district at 180. World Learner has been relatively stable over the last 10 years. Eden Prairie as a public school has been relatively stable. And you'll see that Minnetonka has a low increasing number of students over the last 10 years as represented by ADMs. This is an ADM view as well, but these are the residents coming, or the students coming to us. So of that nearly 400 students that were coming to our district, what do they represent in ADMs and, and generally speaking then budget into the district? You'll see where, they, where they're coming from in this graph. 73 ADM from Waconia, 51 from Shakopee, 38 from Central, and around the remainder of the pie chart. Uh, we just itemized what were the largest um, portions of the population and then grouped together all other in that 79.9. The next pie chart is all of our residents that attend other public schools and the ADMs associated with them. So we just saw this on the bar graph. Minnetonka we know is the largest um, school district receiving our residents. And you'll see Cologne Academy, World Learner, and other districts that end up serving Eastern Carver County school residents. Next slide is really then an attempt to show you just the capture rate. So you'll see the blue trend line is our overall capture rate. So of all of the residents in Eastern Carver County schools, what percentage of them have we been serving? As indicated before, that has been relatively stable with a low in the 75%, I think 75.4, and a high at 76.33. Overlaid on this graph is our kindergarten capture rate, also mentioned before, that trend that we have observed in kindergarten, you'll see here um, in the 16-17 school year, 79% of our students captured and served in Eastern Carver County Schools, and in the most recent school year, 78.56 continuing a trend for four years that we had improved that, but in, in particular the last two, two years, a good trend that we'd like to see. And as mentioned before, if that follows through with high mortality moving from grade to grade, what I would hope to see and believe we would see is our overall capture rate would begin to then tick up as our kindergarten capture rate rolls into additional grades as they move through our entire Eastern Carver County school system. So we're watching that one pretty closely. As I mentioned, we'd look just very briefly at special populations. This is our 10-year trend on three special populations that we monitor closely. You'll see blue is our English learner population on a slow decline, actually, in the last 10 years. Special education for 10 years, relatively stable, but it has increased over the last few years. 
and then our free and reduced lunch population peaked out at almost 20%, 19.7, and then has been just briefly or barely declining in the last few years. Just another statistic that we continue to monitor year over year to see what our population looks like. And then specifically ethnicity for the last school year, another question sometimes our residents or members of our school district have. Um, these are the five primary groups that are monitored by the state of Minnesota and or the federal government. So our American Indian population is very small, less than half of a percent. Our Asian population is approximately 5%, Hispanic population approximately 9%, and our block pap population approximately 55 And the remainder of our population is white, about 80% of our population. And then one slide to uh, share some information from Davis Demographics. Um, and I want to make sure you understand that this is only projected resident enrollment. So the work that Davis is helping us do is identify all of our current resident students and also anticipate where we might gain additional resident students based on the development that's happening in our district and project out our resident growth over time. So what I'll point out is if we go back to that trend that we've seen in increased open enrollment for the last two years, 70 this year, 50 the year before, if we would maintain there around 400 students or increase the number of students coming into Eastern Carver County Schools, that would lay on top of these numbers because this graph represents only the resident students and the increase that we see over time. So as we look out for five years, out to 2023, you see an increase of nearly 900 students, resident students, just in that five-year time frame. And then again, lay on top of that potential other uh, open enrollment students and potentially an increase in that, uh, maybe an increase in our capture rate as well. You can see that we have some significant growth potentially coming up um, in the very near future for Eastern Carver County Schools. So that's a summary of enrollment um, demographics that we presented or uh, uh, Lauren from Davis Demographics shared with you is really a look forward and an attempt to project. Our enrollment report is more of a look backwards and trying to find in the last few years, are there any trends that we're interested in following and monitoring as we move forward? As we marry those two together, we can hopefully provide the board with good information about where we might need to position ourselves moving forward with schools and boundaries and other things that might impact the school district. So with that, if Didi has any other comments to share or if the board has any questions, we'd certainly be willing With to address With the lady them. behind the column hidden in the shadows, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay, nothing. Board members, great. Um, first off, great restraint, holding back all your questions. And now you can get them all queued up and let them fly. David, them thanks, fly. For, <laughs> thanks for all the data. I, I particularly want to you know, the comprehensiveness, but also the consistency. So it was great that I could just plug in this year's numbers into my little spreadsheets and I could do my little stuff. So I really appreciated that. So. Anything for you, Tim. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anybody? No, this is a topic nobody really cares about. But no, no, I, and I would agree with what you said there, Tim. I mean, great job, David, and to your team that put this together. I think in the years past, there's been a lot of discussion on these topics, and part of it is we didn't have all the data, right, and you couldn't see it. So um, at least from my perspective, it's been very helpful to walk through this and have every angle looked at. I am encouraged by the increase of the K kindergarten capture rate, right? Absolutely. Um, and then continue to trend on how that overall affects the total capture, knowing that these trends take time as they come in. But it's certainly encouraging to see, you know, 79% last year, and, you know, close to 79% again. So you see that big bump. Um, and I'm hoping we can continue to retain that as many of the good programs continue to roll out and good data rolls out. So this is helpful. I think it reinforces some of the things we're looking at. Well, and I think that because you did so much data crunching and, and showed it in so many different ways, I mean, it, it eliminates many of the questions that I have. I am excited about this, like Tim said, this projected enrollment. Mm -hmm. And we do have these numbers. I mean, we do have a trend on what may happen going out. So this will give us some really good data to do some projections on as we kind of look at growth in the, in the future and, and what we need to do. So, um, yeah, great job. Really, this is exciting stuff. A couple of questions with that. 
um, and maybe you said this and I missed it, and I apologize. What was the capture rate used for the projected enrollment? Uh, in, obviously, it's been um, kind of pretty consistent. Did you did you use that seventy five percentage, or what was the capture rate? So Davis really doesn't necessarily look at capture rate exactly the same way we do, but process, we provided them four years of data, our own data, again, October 1 data. And then what they did with that four years of data was created a trend that they call mortality. What percent of students roll from one grade to another grade? So they, they found a, a mortality rate at every grade level and rolled students forward throughout the system and then uh, uh, figured out the growth that would be established as a, as a result of that. They also added in this, based on residents, birth rates, and uh, the trend that they calculated on their birth rates <coughs> over time. So, so they're, they're taking some trend data for birth rates and comparing it to our, our capture rate for kindergarten, or how are they establishing that baseline then to do that mortality through the, the different grade levels? So they're looking at every grade level, so one to two, two to three, three to four, and they're doing that for four years and calculating their own mortality rate that has been in our district for the last four years and then using that to continue to project out. So then they'll, they'll apply that again to kindergarten or first grade or second grade for the next 10 years. So all of the students that are in the system, they'll roll forward according to that mortality rate. Um, and then you also have to realize that what happens with these uh, 750 student kindergarten classes as they roll forward, and they project what the incoming kindergarten classes will be based on four years of historical birth rate trends in the district. So you're increasing the number of students in our lower grade levels and dropping off some of our smaller populations in that 11th and 12th grade year. So you mix all of those things together, mortality rates, four years of trends, birth rates coming in, larger grade levels at the younger years, and what you get is an increase in students over time that we're seeing in these projections. So they're using really four years of trend data, both in the birth rates and in our own October 1 data provided to them, to then come up with trend percentiles that they're calculating out over time for us. Okay. Good. Is that helpful, Ron? Yeah, that's good, thank you. Okay. Um, the other thing, and I know um, the, the gentleman from Davis, I believe, spoke to it when they did the presentation about being able to map um, the students across our district. Yes. Do we have the ability with that software to be able to map the 700 or however many kids that we're losing specifically to our neighbor to the north to find out do we have pockets or neighborhoods that we can specifically target with some of the communication materials that Brett and his staff has worked on to talk about some of the great things that are happening in our district or what are some of the opportunities there with that yep. Um, software? Yep. So specifically, every single resident in our district can be mapped to a, a specific address in our district as well. So in my household, we can represent that there are three children living in that specific address in Carver. Um, with that information, we can also, because of the data that we pulled, identify every resident that is being served by a school <coughs> district other than 112 and map those students onto the map and represent them by a point. So within that, we could find in the, and what Davis did is there are boundaries for our elementary schools or middle schools and high schools, but uh, what he talked about was creating study areas, much smaller components or units that we can look at. We can look at a specific study area, for example, and tell you how many residents live in that study area, 52, how many of those residents are we serving, how many are leaving to be served somewhere else. Um, and it even has the capacity to create almost like a heat map. What percentage of students there from 0 to 25, 25 to 50, green, yellow, orange, and red. So we have the capacity now to begin to represent and identify at a very specific level, household by household, parcel by parcel, study area, boundary area, how many of our students are we serving, are they going somewhere else, and then do we want to tackle that, right? communicate with them, get feedback from them. What would we want to do with that information? And then one last question. Um, I know that, do you have any sense, I, I know that some of this information comes from um, outside sources. Um, so we, you don't have listed on the charts the 1718 for our um, 
opened and rolled out or the number of ADMs for like Minnetonka or Eden Prairie. Correct. Um, do you have any sense in terms of, I know that the gap has widened a little bit this year from um, the number of students that are that are opting out of um, Eastern Carver. Do you have any sense, has that gap with like a Minnetonka increased or is there, I think it was 16, 17 information on, yep. on the, from... Um, School finance. Yeah, but do you have any sense, just anecdotally, from what you're seeing in the data uh, from that at all? So any of the enrollment data that we create based on our October one numbers, we have 1718 data, and then anything from school finances because it waits for uh, MDE information and ADMs is always one year behind. Mm -hmm. um, I believe the trend, if I were to look at our capture rate data and then our enrollment data from October one. So the trends that we see in the last 10 years are, are continuing, okay. roughly. Okay. And I could dig into that specifically if you'd like. Thanks, Ron. I think just to build on that for one second, I mean, it, you know, the one data that slide that I go to is just where is the open enrollment that we're enrolling out to, right? And, and that specifically shows I mean, when you look at that, most of the larger ones, Cologne Academy has a small uptick in there, but World Lantern, Eden Prairie, relatively flat. It's really Minnetonka that continues the upward projection there. Right. Um, with your increase that you're seeing in the capture rate in kindergarten, it doesn't seem to slow down this trend. Um, I would be curious to know, you know, in the future as we dive into the data a little bit more, um, what are the grade levels that are going out to Minnetonka? Is this primarily at the kindergarten level or, you know, is there attrition at fifth grade, ninth grade, you know, some of those steps. Yep, and, and we can get that. We can get for prior year, so the 16, 17 data, we, could, we can get that for you. We could even send that out in a, yeah. a report to you. Um, but we can look at it by grade level. School Finances has that, that detailed information for us. I think it would be helpful. Yeah, that would be. I mean, that was... Sure. I mean, it's, they, that, that number has been growing 10% pretty consistently year over year, about 50 students. Mm -hmm. So it would um, be interesting to find out what's what's driving that and how we can better serve those residents. Mm -hmm. um, I did pull a few other things. So at the kindergarten, for example, not a slide that I presented to you, kindergarten in 2008 or 9, the total residents out, not to a particular district, but total residents out, 30% of our kindergarten class. In 2017, 21.44% of our kindergarten class specifically. So that kind of data is available grade by grade to see if there are some more micro trends in there. Um, what, I, what I believe I've seen and we can verify is uh, we have higher numbers of residents out at our, at our higher grades. So something happened along the way, students started leaving and they, they continued all the way through our system. But at our younger grades where our capture rate is increasing, hopefully that's actually gone the other way where we've decrease the number of students that are choosing resident out. And again, over time, as you said, Jeff, mm -hmm. we're a 12 year system. So two years of trend is great, but it'll really take four, five and six years to even get halfway through our system to see that trend begin to level out or maybe even go back the other way potentially. Well, I guess that's, that's the deal. So if our kindergarten capture rate for the last two years has increased, you know, it will be interesting to see because, be, you know, what happens with our neighbor to the north, right? Because yep. once you put them in a school, unless something Absolutely. catastrophic happens, Absolutely. you're going to keep your kids there. Yep. So we really, it really is what is starting to happen at the kindergarten level. And once you put your kids, your oldest, in a school district. A whole family. Then the whole family goes. Correct. So it is going to take a little while to, to turn that ship around. And I agree. Um, but we need to, to target those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. We need to target those pieces and just kind of see how this plays out. But You need to get them at the inflection points, right? Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely. Kindergarten, it's sixth right. grade, it's ninth grade. And ninth grade. the data, again, for the last year seems to show that our capture rate has been strong at kindergarten for the last two years, right? Yep. And it seems to be pretty good at the high school. Yep. It's that it's, you know, it's the elementary and the middle school where they're, you know, we fall by five to seven points. Right. And I think that's the opportunity for, you know, the immediate opportunity. Right. David, this probably doesn't fall in your, in your bailiwick, mm -hmm. but is there any way to get soft data as to why these people are not staying? 
or, or why they're coming for that matter. Right. Um, I think now more with the capacity we have with our Davis demographic software and being able to identify households and areas, we could do some surveying with our communications department. Um, we know with the resident in or, op or the, the open enrollment in, they're already our students. We could get feedback from them and do some surveying. I don't know that we've done that to date, but it's something we could certainly do more of to try and learn what is appealing or in the past if you've made a decision to leave us, help us understand what that is so we could serve better in the future. I do think that, and, and yeah, time will tell whether or not this is a coincidence or not, um, but our kindergarten capture rate increased once the Carver Elementary School was announced. Um, and we started taking having having kindergarten in all of our, all of our elementary schools. <clears throat> in all of our elementary schools. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that could be a coincidence. It may not, but I mean that the evidence kind of there is that point mm -hmm. is when it, it increased by a few yeah. points. And we've also offered the Kinder Academy, mm -hmm. which also gets the early right. Yeah, that's in been there what that three concerned. years now. And that's yeah, about, I can't yeah. remember exactly how many, but yeah. That right. also so, so some of the programs that we're some doing, programming. Yep. plus putting all the kindergarten in those local schools, yep. mm -hmm. plus cover elementary, even though it was online, you know, here in 1718, it was announced and planned. Right. So, you know, that, that could have an influence on it as well. Great and let's point. not lose sight of the fact that the communications department has done a concerted effort to get information <clears throat> out to realtors. We've held those realtor survey, or um, Open seminars. seminars, thank you. Um, that also is is giving out more information about what's going on in our schools and 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 it, just providing them with better details about our school. I think it's all of those things are all it's all combining to help. And and Lisa, you're right. I think the timing with Carver Elementary is is a plus. But um, back to I think it was Ron's question about you know where where are the students living that they're going to? And we look at that heat map. Certainly next to the border, you see it. But quite frankly, it's throughout the district. Mm. And I know we've looked at it before. I know when Diane Barassa was here, we looked at it, and it was surprising to me because it was all throughout the district. Uh, one of the other things we will be l working on that we don't have yet is the students coming into our district. We don't have a map of, say, Hennepin County or um, Dakota County or whatever county they're coming from. So once we get that information, we'll include that and we'll have even more better details about the students that are coming into our school district as well. And Dee Dee, I did want to um, also reiterate what you said. The communications department has done a fabulous yep. job and has done a nice job of selling not just kindergarten, but our entire district. Exactly. And we see that uptick actually starting in 2013 and 14, from 2014 to 2015, um, I'm looking at the capture rate, yeah, that. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, and that reflects that as well. And so it's a team effort for sure. I think overall, I mean, really good news. I mean, it's just, if you look at where the district's going, what it looks like, I think some of these other questions we're just asking is just diving in the data a little bit better to say, you know, how do, how do we serve that population even more and understand that, knowing that it's gonna take a long time for families to move through the systems and stuff like that as, as you know, we create the programs that we have and, and the results that are coming out, we should be able to continue to capture and, and meet the needs of our residents. Right. If we do a better job and capture even more students, mm -hmm. our growth will be even faster than Davis Dem, just another observation, <laughs> it'll be even faster yeah. than Davis Demographics has projected, which becomes a question of facilities and all of those things that come along with the great things that we have to deal with, which is more families, more students, but we also have buildings to deal with and how quickly we can do all of that and stay on top of it. So that's why well, we then, monitor it so closely. And then going back to Fred's point about the survey data, I mean, it would be helpful, I mean, to know if people, you know, as we're trying to plan for long range things, I mean, if there are certain things that we're missing that are attracting them mm -hmm. in other districts, that would be good to know when it's, we are looking at facilities plans to know, you know, if there are certain reasons people are coming or going. Yeah, that's true. It, it will impact facilities. Yeah. Yeah. We do know, I mean, there's, there's some unique programs that we, you know, we don't have Chinese immersion. We don't have right. a gifted and talented program. So, but 
you know, so you have to seed those. That's fine, but that's certainly those programs are capacity constrained, and they're not taking 750 kids in those programs. So it's that's right. What else can we do? When I'm not saying that we need to do every single thing on everyone's list, but just to get a general sense no, of understand. are there yeah. areas yeah. where we are either excelling or deficient compared to yeah. our other districts, or maybe mm -hmm. even there's just a perception of it, mm -hmm. and, we, and we can deal with the perception. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's right. That's good point. That's absolutely. Any other questions? Uh, just a couple things. Um, the uh, the growth overall, I thought was was you know you talked about you know what the in the last ten years we've grown like ten percent, mm -hmm. and but we're looking at growing about the same amount of growth in the next five years. So we're doubling our you know effective. Uh, growth level. So I think that's, you know, without any, you know, notable improvement in, in capture. So I think that's just something that's impressive to note and then something that we always have to keep in mind as we consider our know, long term planning and, and budgeting. Um, we are, you know, definitely, you know, um, a very strongly growing district. Um, I did. I thought that you, you mentioned up front, but the uh, you know the the open enrollment in, mm -hmm. you know that growth of, of seventy, um, you know that's that's the record year over year kind of <coughs> increase um, in that category. So that you know, definitely is is noteworthy that people are are you know taking notice of what we're doing. I think to Fred's and Amy's point, let's understand you know what what's attracting them. Um, as well as you know what's what people are, you know what are drawing them to other districts, so we can better message around those points. But I think that's you know, a, you know another you know um, testament to our our programs and our communication and all that effort. Um, one question I did have is that um, the other of the of the inbound your wedge on the open enrollment in the other was you know like eighty thereabouts. Pretty large, you know. There you go. Mm -hmm. Pretty big. I mean, you've eliminated all our neighbors, so we got a lot of people that are traveling a long ways. Or how do I interpret that? That almost quarter of the wedge, or quarter of the pie. So by ADMs, mm -hmm. again, um, what you may be looking at there partly is specialized programs that are drawing students from quite a w wide variety of locations. It might be a STAR, it might be a Prairie Care, it might be a TAP program. Mm. So Does that include IAA? Yeah, the Independent Arts Academy. Students who might be coming to the IAA, right? Yeah, and if they're not from one of these other... Right. If they're right. not right. from Eden Prairie or Conia. Because they have the ability to... Yeah. Or, they're just, or they're just coming farther, right? right. So they're right behind <laughs> uh, Bell Plain at 20 and Jordan at 20 could be somebody at 15, and that takes 79 and 0.9. We just didn't list out all of the uh, districts that are sending students to us. But there are programs that might be drawing them from greater distances mm -hmm. than our most close neighbors. Yeah, I mean, because you're talking what it is. greater than a half an hour commute, right? Yep. I mean, talking about for beyond those near, near, uh, near adjacent neighbors. Okay, I just thought that was uh, notably large. Um, we talked about about the capture rate. I think it would be helpful. I'd like to uh, see how the sixth grade capture rate has evolved over time. I'd be curious to see if there's been any, how that's if that's changed at all, or if that's been the same. Right. Um, you know, I just anecdotally there was a fair amount of feedback from people that, you know, they they weren't going to middle school here because that start time was so early. Well, we've that has changed. Yeah. Um, so, and I don't know, you know, that's something I'm sure we've messaged a little bit, but something maybe to look into. And I'm just curious if that's, there's been any change in that sixth grade capture and maybe that's an opportunity. I don't know. I know uh, when Dee Dee does projected budget, one of the things that we had looked at this year was at that inflection point, sixth grade. So um, our team looked at the last three years, I believe, how many students do we generally increase in sixth grade over just rolling our own fifth grade or sixth grade? Mm -hmm. And I think the average was about 40. The largest increase is actually at ninth grade, and I believe the largest, uh, the highest capture rate in our district is at ninth grade. 
because of an inflection point when some of our private schools and, and I think and we're doing a much better job of capturing our to the show. Ninth grade. Right. So sixth grade and ninth grade for sure, Tim. Those are interesting inflection points that yep. we could do year over year, grade by grade, and see where we're at. I'd be, I'd be interested to see that. Okay. Um, but just and lastly on the on the communications, I mean we have a you know, we have a very effective, small but effective relative to my understanding of the resources that are that we're uh, up against in uh, other areas, in other um, districts. So, I mean, it's just, you know, the fact that we are seeing improvements is great. And I think that, you know, we should keep, you know, as we understand this data and assimilate it, I mean, part of, you know, our consideration is should we be spending a little bit more, right? If we were to spend, you know, whatever, another X dollars, could we, you know, could we boost that caps rate, do we think, if we, you know, did more mailings or, you know, whatever? What do we think that is? So that's where I think doing the research that um, Fred and Amy kind of alluded to and referenced and and figuring out what maybe we could do if there's, okay, we need to, because it really is just about messaging. People are just getting information, as we've seen from our various surveys in the past, from all these different things. I think the more and the better data we have from this demographics to understand where everyone's at, you know, we can be more precise with that, those mailings and getting those messages, you know, and, and we've got, you know, this whole district of choice, the fact that we've got, you know, we are uh, relatively in this increasing um, environment of mega schools. You know, we have these, you know, these gems, right? This community has supported these, you know, nice, you know, appropriately sized institutions that provide so many more opportunities. So I think just continue to get that message out is beneficial. So... That's all I have. So, anything else? Okay. Thank One you very things. much. Thank you. Tim, I did just want to make a comment on um, Lisa, and I think you, you noticed him as David was presenting the free and reduced lunch percentage that it has gone down quite a bit. Um, and it'll be interesting to watch that because one of the things that I had um, been watching over these last few years, so as we look at that growth, when you look at where our growth is coming in, they're coming in in those new houses, which are fairly expensive homes. Um, and so <clears throat> I wouldn't be surprised to see that trend continue down if our enrollment continues um, to grow. So it doesn't mean that overall numbers of, of students on free and reduced lunch might be growing, but we're getting so much growth um, you know, in the, from those new homes that we're offsetting some of that. So you know, another area of concern and something we talk about a little bit with teaching and learning is kind of that gap, right? So the, the, there's still a lot of need for those kids. And there's a very large gap between, you know, kind of the have and have nots that as we, you know, start talking about equity and, and providing uh, the right services for kids. So it's just something that <clears throat> we'll want to continue to monitor um, as we move forward. That's a good point. Yeah, and, and, very good And point. that was the assumption that I made when I saw those Correct. numbers decreasing is that the growth is from higher incomes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's it's slightly deceiving that those numbers are decreasing because I don't think the the percentage is decreasing, but the numbers are not. I did do uh, ethnicity by year. I shared with you the mm -hmm. the five groups just for a single year, um, but I broke down all of those ethnic groups on a ten year trend as well. What's interesting when you combine all of our ethnic diversity and then look at our remaining uh, Caucasian population. In 0809, we were 85.5 percent Caucasian, and in 1718, we were 79.6 percent Caucasian. So, um, even though the free and reduced trend may be going down, definitely our diversity trend is going up. So, as we think about <coughs> equity and the equity work and cultural awareness and some of the things that teaching and learning talks about with cultural competency with our teaching staff and serving the needs of students definitely another trend that we need to keep an eye on and be aware of as we move forward. When was the last, when was that the earlier reference point, David? What was the year time? In 08, 09. So it's been a while. So it's about a, yeah, about a, and about a 6% change in our population over those 10 years. Great. Very good. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Thank you. Okay, TNL team, 
Amy and crew. <coughs> well, good evening. Tonight, Chris Henches and Jason Polsky are here um, to provide an update on our work toward standards-based learning, standards-based grace grading, and our use of the tool Empower. As you know, this has been an area of significant focus for our district over the last few years. And so tonight's a great opportunity for us to not only review the work that's happened during this past school year, but also to preview uh, some of our plans for the upcoming school year. Perfect. Well, good evening. Thank you. So this evening, uh, Jason and I will really highlight four key areas. First, the why of standards-based learning, grading, and power. It's really important to, for us all to understand why we're doing what we're doing and how it benefits our learners here in Eastern Carver County Schools. Secondly, we'll take a look at and discuss the key focus areas for 2017-18, so the work that uh, was accomplished throughout the course of that year, or this past school year. Uh, also highlight avenues that we collected feedback and input from stakeholders throughout the course of the year uh, to just get feedback about where are our strengths and where are opportunities for growth. And then finally, uh, highlight some of our action plans for the 2018-19 school year, really based on that feedback and input from stakeholders throughout the course of the year. So throughout the process uh, of the presentation, we'll, we'll be hitting those marks and then have an opportunity for questions uh, at the end. So first and foremost, why standards-based learning? It's really important as Jason and I are working with staff, working with students, working with parents, we always start our conversations with the why. We really feel it's important because it, it provides us with our goals and our focus areas around this work and how it supports our learners. So there's really five key pieces that we discuss and that we highlight. And I guess before we get into those uh, five key pieces, it's also important to, to note the connection to personalized learning. So as we think about personalized learning, the connection to in purposeful instruction, assessment, and feedback, and also purposeful learning. This work really gives us the opportunity to, to make learning purposeful and meaningful for our students. And, and by these five key areas uh, on the screen here, we have the opportunity to accomplish that. So really, it helps us outline essential skills and concepts for all of our courses to have a really clear guide on what are the expectations uh, with that course. And it's very transparent, obviously, to the teacher as well as to our students and parents. It helps us provide clarity in what we teach and assess, and then how we also report out uh, that learning and the progress that students are making uh, towards mastery of the standards. So you know, we've talked about power standards and learning targets, and really the power standards and learning targets help shape and provide that framework of outlining those essential concepts that we are teaching, assessing, reporting on. It also gives us an opportunity to provide clarity uh, to students and parents about the process or the progress that students are making, where they are as learners, and what's next for them. Uh, do they have opportunities to continue moving forward? Is there, are there elements that they have not learned yet? And how do we make sure that we're inter intervening when appropriate uh, to support students and also moving forward uh, when it's appropriate as well? Also, really important, it gives us a chance to set high expectations and to maintain high ex expectations for all students because we have such specific information around progress and clarity around what we believe all students should know and be able to do, we can uh, set those high expectations and really aligns with personalized learning of building those partnerships with our students and supporting them to, to meet their specific needs. And then last, I, I think I mentioned a little bit throughout these uh, five points, but really it provides transparency and consistency through the entire teaching and learning process. Uh, by going working through our standards-based learning process, it gives us an opportunity to provide consistency uh, throughout the course uh, of our district. So an experience that a student is receiving at Bluff Creek, very similar to an experience that they're uh, experiencing at Victoria and so on and so forth. But by articulating it, the power, power centers and learning targets and talking about these practices at a local level give us a, a good opportunity to provide that consistency across the district. So Jason is going to talk specifically about standards-based grading and then how Empower supports standards-based grading. So I, th I think after you talk about, start talking about the why of SBL, uh, obviously grading comes into play. What, what our grades represent? And as part of our SBL with standards-based learning, we get into the grading piece that we really want the grade to reflect 
how students are achieving amongst those power standards and learning targets. So they need to, they need to communicate that achievement that they are doing within those standards. Um, and uh, it also helps us create a focus on what a student will learn, not necessarily what has uh, been taught to them. Uh, I, when, we, when we start to put those standards in front of uh, students, what uh, generally will occur is that students will start to be able to gauge where they are, are at within that continuum of learning. So I know that if I'm at a, a basic level of learning and my goal is to get to the meets level, they have descriptors that are gonna help them be able to say, this is what I know, this is what I wanna be able to do. I give the analogy a lot of times when I'm working with teachers about do you, have, do you have those students that are kind of at that point where they're kind of like frustrated, they don't know what they need to do next? Well, this is that avenue that instead of a student being able to say, you know what, I don't know it, I quit. This gives them the avenue to be able to say, I know this. And not only do I know this, when I look at that next level of learning, I see some language around that so that when I go to my teacher and start to ask questions, I can start to ask questions around that language. It doesn't look like I don't know anything. I, I'm, in a sense, been empowered to be able to have that conversation. For teachers around SBG, they're able to take that data then as they're looking at classrooms and see where kids are obtaining, they're able to make some data-informed decisions around what they might be doing structurally within their classroom. If I see that I have a whole class that's in a particular uh, avenue uh, that needs more help on something, I can do something with my whole class. If I see that there are some smaller groups that need uh, some additional instruction around something, I can make some de uh, determinations around that as well. So the, the helping and making some of those data formed uh, adjustments as it relates to where kids are at is something that uh, has been advantageous as we've gone through. Another way of why, another reason why of uh, standards based uh, grading is not only to help students understand where they currently are at, but also where they're going and where they're not as of yet. Um, so that it gives them a little bit of a roadmap. I, I think when I came through school, oftentimes it was here we go with chapter one. What's in chapter one? I don't know. We'll find out as we go through it. With power standards and learning targets and as we give feedback of, to, to students with where they are within them, kids are understanding where we're going, where I'm at, where am I trying to go. Uh, and then lastly, it just helps support the learning by focusing on what has been learned and obviously what has not been yet. So again, it's all about that learning piece that's within there. Uh, one thing around standards-based grading, I think one of the misnomers that's out there is that standards-based learning or grading, we get rid of letter grades. At our secondary level, we still have our traditional letter grade that's being calculated as a part of uh, how kids are doing. With Empower, Empower is really a tool that we use to help support not only standards-based learning, but standards-based grading that we're doing within our district. Um, it's really used in two, in two different ways. One way that Empower is used is, to, is strictly to track how kids are doing within their achievement on power standards and learning targets. Another way that it can be used is a, what's called an LMS or learning management system where teachers can put together activities, resources for students to be able to go and look at. Uh, they could also post uh, different uh, materials they used for instruction so students could come back and look at them and review them. So an LMS side is also available uh, within Empower. Empower helps support our standards-based learning and grading by continuing that pop purposeful uh, monitoring of learning. It also helps communicate, uh, whether through the summary grade or into the details of how a student is obtaining power standard by power standard or learning target by learning target. And even activity by activity as, kids, as students were doing practice around a particular learning target. It also helps provide clarity so students are able to see where they're at within particular learning targets and what they might need. This helps on a student level when it comes to things like win time within our, within our schools that students are able to see, I, hey, I'm only at a basic level at this. I really want to get to a meets level. Let's see if my teacher is offering something for win time that I can go and meet with them or even before or after school types of things. 
The data for instructional and learning decisions is also there, so, so teachers have an easier way to look at. Uh, one of the things that teachers will do is use Empower to look and see if I do have small batches of kids, students that I should be able to pull in during a win time and maybe give some more instruction around that or try a different instructional strategy to try to reach them with the goal being, of course, that learning. And not in last, uh, not uh, last uh, or least, but it also promotes that consistency of power standards and learning targets. Essentially, uh, teachers and students are, are gauged on those power standards and learning targets. There isn't others that are on there or added to, so it creates a consistency uh, in terms of our guaranteed and viable curriculum that no matter uh, what building I'm going to, I'm being upheld to the same power standards and learning targets, which are being reported out uh, very similarly throughout uh, all of the buildings within our district. So before we get into looking at some of the key focus areas for this last school year and action plans for next year, just wanted to provide you with some information about implementation framework that we're really focusing on and working through through this process. And it's really important, this is a really important part of the process, and really our focus is on readiness, and there's really two items that we're, we need to consider and, and think about with readiness. It's really course readiness, so from our power standards and learning targets, we need to ensure that they are articulated accurately and really aligned with our, our standards and test specs and so on and so forth. So teachers really uh, dig into the Minnesota standards or national standards, whatever standards you're using, align those with test specs, look at vertical alignment to ensure that we have consistency from K through, through 12 and so on and so forth. And then additionally, with that readiness is also staff readiness. So as we think about the implementation from a teaching and learning perspective, thinking about instruction assessment is really the key focus areas. And then as we continue to move through this process, it's really the feedback and reporting piece. So this is just a summary. We have more detailed information. We call it AKA the plan. Uh, but these are just the, the really gives you a little bit of insight as to the work that uh, the teaching and learning department is partnering with building administrators and coaches uh, to support teachers in the building as they continue to learn, grow, and migrate throughout this work. So really step one or phase one is the planning, and that's really around the power centers and learning target work. Uh, vertical alignment and then the reflecting on practices from the traditional sense to uh, to this standards-based learning. Uh, second from there is really piloting, so putting those power centers and learning targets into place or really teaching and assessing them without the grading. Uh, what we find, and I have this experience from a teacher perspective as well, is once you articulate your power centers and learning targets, you don't really know if they're exactly hitting the mark until you use them, until you are teaching and assessing in the classroom. And so through that process, teachers are using those power standards and learning targets and getting feedback from students, reflecting on how it works without the grading elements, and then coming back to the table for what we call a refresh with those power standards and learning targets before actually migrating to the grading part of it and using Empower. So we're really trying to put a concrete, implement, thoughtful implementation plan uh, as teachers are working through it. Uh, this is the focus of professional development every, in every building and really guiding the work that's happening um, with our administrators and teachers. Uh, what we would expect and what would our, our goal would be from an elementary perspective, and we'll show you some numbers and some data here in a second, is we would have full migration uh, through this implementation process at the elementary level uh, for our core and encore courses by next year. Um, right now, or in a second, we'll show you we're at 100% of all of our courses with power centers and learning targets developed and a high percentage of teachers that will be using Empower next year. At the middle level, our goal and our expectation would be uh, the same. At, by next year, 1920, uh, we would have 100% of our core and encore teachers migrated um, through this phase system. At the high school level, we uh, are in a little bit different place. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. And so we're working through that process. We uh, slowed that process down a little bit this year, and we'll talk a little bit about um, what that looked like. Uh, but really ensuring that we have the correct information and the correct implementation plan uh, to ensure that uh, our high school moves forward uh, correctly and, and at a positive rate. There's a lot of variables at the high school level 
At the elementary level, we have 100 courses. At the middle level, we have 100 courses. At the high school, we have 200 courses. So just pure capacity with the number of staff we have to do all of that work, if we think about readiness from a course perspective and a staff perspective, it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, the information in, that Jason and I have from all of the documentation that we have, as well as from billing administrators, right now we, we estimate roughly 40% of our courses are in phase one, so really the development. 30% of, this is high school, 30% uh, of high school are in phase two, so really putting those power centers and learning targets into play, but not using um, Empower and not grading. And then 30% uh, are full implementation, so using Empower um, and standards-based learning. Sorry, Chris, what was phase one? I'm sorry, what was phase one again? 40% uh, okay. high school, uh, high 30 school. Yep, 30% piloting at the high school, phase two, and 30% implementation. So going into the key focus areas, it segues in here. So uh, one of the, the areas that we really, really focus on and we will continue to is the power center to learning target work, speaking of the two pieces of readiness. So... There were, there's really two pieces. There's a refresh work and there's also the development. So refresh would be a course that is in phase two. They teach and assess and they come back to the table to make adjustments that they believe need to happen before going into phase three. And the development of course is in phase one. So as you can see here, uh, the numbers that we have on the screen, from an early childhood perspective, we have all of our courses 100% completed. Our early childhood uh, classes are using Empower, providing feedback to families about the progress that uh, our preschool students are, are making. Um, at the elementary level, we had, uh, we had 43 courses come in this year, seven content areas, and overall we're 100% completed with power centers and learning targets at the elementary level. At the middle level, we had 28 courses come in this year to do mostly refresh work, some development, and uh, overall we have 99% of the courses at the middle level completed. The one course that we do not have completed is a, a middle level elective that's offered at one school. So we'll have to, we'll have to get that completed uh, sooner rather than later. And at the high school level, we had 30 courses come in over the course of the year that uh, was overall, so overall we have 30% completed. Uh, we also, at the high school level, going back to some of those numbers, we, we hosted department standards-based learning meetings for math, science, English, social studies, and Spanish. And then we also had every, every course, or every, I'm sorry, every department at the high school level did a power centers and learning target audit throughout the course of the year as well. So they listed all of the courses in their department and provided information as to where they are in this process. So Jason and I are using that information along with the information from the billing administration as to where teachers are at to develop our, our kind of our three-year roadmap as to here's where departments are at in terms of their, their phase development for the courses as well as here's where teachers are at for teacher readiness. So putting those two pieces together to develop our roadmap moving forward. I think from a strategic standpoint, uh, we really keyed in and focused on the elementary and middle level this year because we knew we had an opportunity to expedite some of that work where those courses were at. And I, I, I feel like we executed that with the number of courses that we do now have um, 100%. And then we'll show you some percentages of how many teachers will be using Empower next year. So now we'll really focus our attention on the high school. And we did, uh, we did slow some things down this year and really communicated and worked closely with building administration, professional development to articulate this phase system to the staff. So it's very clear the roadmap that we're going to be working through gives some concrete, uh, concrete guidance and framework to continue moving the work forward. All of that information is actively being compiled. We met this morning uh, with the secondary or the high school principals, assistant principals, personalized learning coaches to continue the conversation of the plan moving forward, and that will continue throughout the summer and, and of course, throughout the course of the year. Uh, some other areas of focus, uh, continued professional learning around teaching, assessing, uh, providing feedback and reporting on standards, and all four of those elements are extremely important to the process. And as we talked about the phase work, 
you know, teachers are at, at different places. So from a professional development perspective, as we talk about personalized learning with our students, we're really keying in and focusing on how do we personalize our professional development for our staff as well and meeting them where they're at to, to support them and taking the next step forward that they need. So that uh, continues and will continue to be a focus. Uh, we were talking this morning, we have focus fives that uh, all buildings work on. It's really kind of their goals throughout the course of the year. Standards-based learning, is a, it will be a focus five area again this year, which will drive a lot of the professional development and learning that they do with their staff. Did a lot of professional learning uh, from a DLT perspective, as well as uh, just throughout the course of professional, other professional development with our building administration. So really focused on a shared understanding around this work per, uh, with standards-based learning as well as assessment practices. That work will continue throughout the course of the 18, 19 years as well. Uh, Jason and I have also worked very closely with Empower on adjustments, and, and Jason will uh, highlight some of the adjustments that will be coming out next year, which we believe will be a benefit to our students and parents, making the system much more user-friendly. So Jason will highlight those. But we've been in very close communication with Empower with the feedback that we've been receiving from teachers, from parents, and from students, and uh, partnering with them to find solutions uh, to ensure that our students and our, our families uh, feel successful with the program. And it's, it's doing what we need it to do to support our learners. And then also another key focus is, is the feedback and input from stakeholders and really identifying themes throughout the course of that and addressing our opportunities for growth. So uh, we will we'll highlight some of those things in our plans for 2018-19. So Jason, we'll talk a little bit about some of the numbers here. So we, we kind of started this journey back in 1516 when we first started using Empower. And at that time, we had about a dozen teachers that were in the system uh, and piloting for us at that time. Uh, 1617, we went to 90 teachers. So we increased there by 78. And then you can see the statistics there for 1718 as well as 1819. Uh, one thing just to be aware of is in the total there, you'll see there's 712 teachers in 1718. That took into account all teachers, all of our specialists, counselors, all of those things. What Chris and I tried to do for 1819, where you see the uh, triple sixes, is we tried to adjust and account for really who were the classroom teachers that had classes that were rostered to them, meaning that they were going to be issuing a grade or a credit for them. Um, so we tried to take that into account. Uh, as we were looking at those numbers. So you can see our increase there, 1718 went to 257, 1819 went to uh, 427. And then we did our breakdown as well in terms of our early childhood. Uh, one, of our, one of the things with our preschool program, they were using a different system to give feedback with uh, where students were at in terms of a three-year-old, four-year-old, and five-year-old. Uh, so as uh, they were looking at that particular system, it was time to kind of exp explore others, and they de de uh, had determined to use Empower at that point. So now our three, four, and five-year-olds in preschool uh, have feedback that's in there. One of the advantages that that, uh, that gives us is that any of our students that are coming from our preschools into our kindergartens, those kindergarten teachers can already see some of that data and what students know or don't know yet as they're coming from our preschool program. So one of our benefits uh, of, of, of early childhood joining us with this. Our elementary percentage you can see as we've increased uh, uh, almost twofold from 40% to 72%. Our middle school uh, went up quite drastically and our high school even made some gains in terms of number of teachers. One of the things that I think in terms of the, the trend that we're seeing is that really the first time that a teacher goes through with teaching and then actually reporting out using Empower, generally they're doing that with one course. And then it becomes very quick for them to pick up additional courses after that. So it's really about getting that ball rolling. And as soon as we get that ball rolling and teachers are getting used to then how do I teach and assess and report with our standards and our, with our power standards and learning targets, and they go through and do that for a particular course, 
it becomes uh, easier for them to do it for other, other courses as well. The other byproduct that we're also seeing is that those teachers that have been through that process one time, if they come and sit in, sit in and help create power standards and learning targets, the quality that we're getting uh, from those teachers is also increasing very drastically. And the time spent on developing those starts to decrease as they go through uh, that process. Um, the other piece is around our feedback and input. So there's been a, there's been a lot of informal feedback and input that we've collected throughout the year. Uh, one of the things uh, in my role is there's actually a way that any student or parent can actually give some feedback about Empower. So in my role, I continually get a lot of those emails, and a lot of those emails are going straight back to Empower as well. As I go through and look at what uh, the particular issue is or the want, uh, those questions are going back not only to Chris, and myself, but also then we're, we're striving to also include Empower in giving them feedback. As a result of a lot of that, uh, when I show a little bit of what's coming in terms of some uh, adjustments to Empower, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of the feedback came directly from our students, our parents, that is going to be included now within, their, within Empower's product. Formally, we also created uh, some avenues for some feedback and input. So you can see amongst a, a lot of different uh, committees and advisory groups um, that uh, we uh, have done uh, since uh, probably the second half of the school year, which included uh, you know, the stakeholders from just about every uh, part. The only part that we don't have there is community members that uh, don't have students within the district. Uh, but uh, a lot of great input, a lot of great discussion. Some of, the, uh, some of my highlights would have been when we had teachers and students together and talked about not only standards-based learning, but also in power and a lot of the feedback and how there was some back and forth and different perceptions that were going on just within uh, the small groups that we had and how they came to an understanding. They might not have agreed with each other, but they could understand why, oh yeah, this might make it easier for you as the teacher, or yes, I can understand why you as a student, this might be more difficult. Um, so there was some understanding that, uh, that was uh, coming along this as well, but a lot of that feedback and input that uh, we got from these committees, again, was brought back uh, to Chris and myself as we went through and uh, tried to look for common themes and, and things like that. Some of the strength themes that we got uh, as we went through all of this uh, was clarity and transparency and learning expectations. And uh, yes, that's exactly the part of the why of the SBL. I mean, if we're not hitting that and not getting that clarity, uh, then we're not doing something right. So that was one of the strengths that we got from this. Another was uh, some, the specific feedback, uh, especially from students and teachers talking about knowing where my students are or knowing where I am at as a student and knowing where I'm going as a learner uh, that really helped them. And then also the flexibility um, that was another piece that was there, that there was some flexibility now that uh, um, when I first started teaching 20 years ago, the curriculum was, here's the textbook, mm -hmm. teach chapters one through eight. Now, if I have my power standards and learning targets as a teacher, I can make some instructional decisions that, yeah, for the most part, I might be following that curriculum resource, but there might be other avenues that I might have to supplement that with to, for the benefit of my learners. I think when we talk about our personalized learning approach as well, it creates some flexibility because if students are able to see and articulate where they're going, uh, it helps them personalize and be able to uh, come up with plans where they might be able to come up with the idea of here's what I'm going to do to show you that I could get to this level of learning. Uh, so that clarity within our power standards and learning target work is coming back out and we're hearing that in our feedback in terms of that personalized learning. In terms of some growth themes, I think Chris is going to take you through uh, some of that around our action steps. Yeah, so there are really six key highlight areas as we uh, think about 2018-19, so some of the action steps uh, that we are actively working on and will continue throughout the course of the year. So I, I will run through the six, and then Jason's going to go back and uh, show you some examples of some of the power upgrades that will uh, be going into to effect here for the 2019 or 18-19 school year. So first and foremost, one of the themes and some of the work that we've been uh, partnering with uh, Brett and his staff on is just better communication, more consistent, more effective uh, communication and ongoing communication. So we uh, see that as an area and an opportunity for growth. 
and really looking at it from the perspective of supporting our families and students with understanding the why, understanding the systems, and how to navigate the systems effectively, ultimately to support so learners can support themselves and, and families can support their learners. And so as we, as we continue to move forward, there's, <laughs> we, just, we linked the website here that uh, was developed the second half of last year, second semester, and was sent out uh, to families and so as we are thinking about communication, it's really at all levels. So what kind of communication are we providing at the district level, at the building level, at the classroom level, um, just in equipping teachers and administrators with various talking points and that shared understanding so they feel comfortable communicating and also are communicating uh, effectively throughout the course of a school year. I think the most effective communication is at the teacher level when a, a student and parent can have conversations with the teacher. So how do we continue to support teachers through our professional development uh, so they are communicating effectively and feel comfortable uh, communicating effectively? How we continue to take a look at studying the grading scales and practices with our, within our standards-based learning system. That's something that we have been working with Empower on, gleaning insights, other systems, as well as doing uh, our own independent research. And that is something that it takes a little bit of time because we need to ensure that we are getting feedback and, and doing our due diligence in terms of researching to ensure that if we make any adjustments, that we consider all the unintended consequences so we're not making an adjustment and then a year later we're making another adjustment. So that's something that as we get feedback from parents and students and teachers that we, uh, that we are studying and, and looking at what if any adjustments can we make to our current system. Uh, we, as I noted before, we're, we've been working very closely with Empower. Uh, we have a, uh, I believe we have a great relationship with them. They've been very responsive to the feedback that uh, we provided in trying to make adjustments, and, and Jason will show a few highlights. We've uh, kind of completely revamped our professional learning and training around standards-based learning and Empower. Uh, we're really focusing on the teaching and learning and the instructional and assessment practices as our entry point with using the system in power and really using it as that reporting and feedback tool. It also has the learner management system element, and that's something that we support teachers uh, on onboarding when they feel comfortable. So really focusing on the intent of Empower is around the feedback and the reporting and uh, really supporting our standards-based learning. So keying in and focusing on that, uh, we kind of we have really three phases of training. First is what we call small batch and with small teams at the building level. Our digital coaches, personalized learning coaches, instructional coaches uh, support teachers with that. This is the first year we did it and had a lot of really good feedback from staff because they were able to they were able to go to those trainings with their teammates, feel comfortable to ask difficult questions. In the past, we brought teachers here to the district office for training, and they were with like 50 colleagues, and they won't ask the same questions they will in a venue like that. So we saw a lot of benefit to having smaller groups and really talk about the philosophy and, uh, and the work around standards-based learning. And then we transitioned into, over the summer in August here, called Empower um, Ready for Success, Getting Ready for Success, that will really get into kind of the nuts and bolts of not only the system, but also the teaching and learning and the communication practices. And then we'll continue to wrap around next year with kind of the phase three of training at the building level with our digital coaches and Jason continuing to support uh, teachers as they, as they get acclimated to the system. I think one of the things that we've also found and recognized and we need to continue to be responsive to is teachers really don't always know the questions to ask until they actually get into the system. And so we uh, fully recognize that we need to be responsive to those questions and to have really timely support because when teachers have that question, that's when we need to support them to continue moving forward. Uh, over the course of the the spring, there was a, a reassessment and assessment committee developed, uh, as well as the district leadership team uh, worked through assessment. I think some of the feedback that uh, we've been provided from all stakeholders are, is around just assessment practices, the, the notion of redos and retakes, and how do we develop some guidance uh, at the building level to support teachers and to support students and families just to provide consistency in those practice and some specific concrete um, guidance to support them. And then last, I did talk about the, 
the SBL implementation phases. So we'll continue to use that as our, our framework and our roadmap, roadmap to support our teachers moving forward. So really, I think it's important to note, you know, going back to teachers don't know the questions asked until they get into it. So the idea of once they get into phase three, we don't just let them go and they're off doing their own thing. So it's really continuing to, to loop back around in that ongoing professional development to support them as they're continuing to move forward. So I'll let Jason uh, circle back around to talk a little bit about a couple of the Empower upgrades. So one of the upgrades that are, there's going to be coming up here in, uh, in August uh, that we will get installed and actually have active uh, for our students to use is uh, basically the student interface. So as students log into Empower, they get a list of all of their classes. And then they're able to see some information about how they're doing. Um, and uh, quite frankly, with uh, the 17-18 school year, a lot of students commented a lot about the clickiness. I have to click all over the place to get to the materials that I'm looking for. So it, me being more solutions oriented, I always start to ask, well, tell me, how could they fix that? Uh, one of the ideas they had was the ability to pin things. So one of the things that is coming up is actually the ability to pin. So this next up area is the ability for students to take activities that they're currently working on and pin them right to the top rather than having to click through folder by folder to finally get to the activity. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, I would click on a Romeo and Juliet, would be, would be like a folder. Within there, I might go to Shakespeare, which is another folder. And now I could finally get to something that I was working on. And if I wanted to pin it, all I have to do is click on it and pin it. Um, after we went back last spring then and got some more feedback from students, <coughs> one of the students said, hey, I have a great idea. What if my teacher could pin it for me? That's feedback that Empower is now trying to incorporate into this new student view. So as a teacher, I could even pin those next up things for my students so that students wouldn't have to click around. Another piece of uh, input that our students gave is, well, I turned something in and my, student, and my teacher gave me feedback, but where is that? How can I see what I scored? Uh, so now within what Empower calls their class log, I can see, for example, this Henry V essay, what I had scored on it, uh, so that that feedback will be right there that students will be able to see now when I've got feedback, what does that look like, what did I score, now I can get into some of the comments and things that are, that are within there. So we think the, the, the two great ideas that our students had that first started with kind of a complaint turned into a solution-based uh, idea that came from our student body, and that's something that Empower has taken now and is incorporating into their system. So uh, kudos to our students to just not complain, but also to think about what would make this better and giving us those ideas because it's definitely helping not only them uh, in terms of Empower, but also helping our learners now that they'll be able to get to the stuff faster and sooner than what they had to this previous school year. The other piece uh, that uh, we as Eastern Carver County Schools are directly uh, influencing is an idea around what Empower calls their workbook. Uh, to give you a, a, the best analogy is that in Infinite Campus currently, there, there's a little a bell icon that's there, a notification icon. And essentially what that does is that if you click on it, it shows you your most recent things that were scored at the top and then kind of gives you a timeline or historical uh, evidence there of what's been scored. Essentially, uh, working with Chris and myself, getting some feedback from parents, as well as students, they were wanting to see that same type of, uh, of thing. So we've been working with Empower and trying to generate an idea where they would have what's called a workbook, where I would have the ability to go through and pick which class I wanted to look, look at or all of my classes. If I wanted to, I could also filter based on a date range, or I could filter based off of things that are scored, not scored, uh, missing uh, below my goal score so that I could see historically that if this was just graded it would show up at the top and I think this is generally what we're hearing from parents a lot is my child just did a test or just did a project how did they score on it uh, currently within our progress report it's difficult to find because you'd have to kind of know a power standard and learning target that was associated with that project so this is helping answer that type of a question that parents are wanting to look in after they kind of look at that summary grade 
Okay, my kid's got a B plus. Okay, let's look at some more details. What's making up that B plus? Or my kid just took a test. How did they do? They might go to this workbook idea to be able to get that information and then be able to uh, have conversations with their learner or have conversations with the teacher about how their student is learning currently and, and then what other opportunities are there for them to continue their learning. So I, I, I think uh, through those two, we've, we've been able to gather those two examples. We've been able to gather a lot of great input uh, and work with Empower very closely to come up with some possible solutions that I, I believe will, will help uh, our families and our, and our learners as they continue uh, within our school district. And I think really the goal to, is really to, to ease the user friendliness from a student perspective and then also to, to provide easy access for parents to, to look at progress in a way that makes sense. So as, as these go live, uh, we're supposed to have them very soon, so we'll start working on the communication around it, a series of videos that will be sent out to families as well as supporting our administrators and teachers uh, through professional development with this. So again, uh, just communicating as much as possible so uh, students and parents are understanding exactly how to, how to look at these and, and use them effectively. So that is all Jason and I have. Uh, so it's opportunity for any questions that you may have around the work that uh, we did throughout the course of the year, or what we have uh, what we have up to uh, for the, so this coming year. Great. Thank you, Chris and Jason. And, and I no doubt there are a few questions. There are a few questions, and I have to excuse myself. So I just want to. Um, say, I mean, I almost stand up and cheered when, when you showed um, the, that user interface, that student user interface, and um, because, yeah, the amount of clicks, that, that was kind of um, kind of fun. So you've made it easier around my dinner table, but it, it's, it's exciting to see, um, you know, so I know software development and yeah, the process. And it really is kind of that, that GUI interface that's so important. And they may seem like little things, but I'm excited to see if that really makes a difference in kind of that, that student um, impact and, and how that goes. And what it, what's exciting is part of the issue I know that getting kind of getting the high school online is the student piece of it. Um, and as these students in you know middle school kind of come up, it's going to get easier and easier. But um, this is really encouraging. I know that you guys have done a lot of work. We get a lot of feedback from community, parents, students, and I'm just really impressed that that you're taking that feedback, are solution oriented, and we're seeing the result here. So thank you so much. Um, good work. And again, I apologize that I have to excuse myself here and and take off but no doubt there's other questions and, and other feedback so thank you thanks Lisa. I have a just a <laughs> couple of questions and and it's coming from from my point of view which as we all know technologically speaking is pretty low but that's, I think, where a lot of people and students and, and, and family are, too. First of all, though, I, I do challenge severely the fact that you think you've been teaching for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> that, that just isn't mathematically possible. It makes us all feel old. <laughs> you started when you were eight. <laughs> okay. With all these, it, it, again, it, it, there, there's so much to this. And, and I'm coming from the point of view of, again, of, of further back. And, and staff, for one reason or another, a few anyway, will, will corner me. And, and, and rarely are they saying, man, I, I really get this, and this is flying, and it, it's, it's, it's just the best thing since sliced bread. What, are, what concerns do you hear? First of all, I think it is overwhelming. Uh, and, and but but we're looking. I'm looking at it from the point of view of having not done anything with it, versus the the teachers who have been doing this now for for a, a considerable length of time. What concerns do you hear from from staff, parents, 
students about what, what, what they're most nervous about, apprehensive about, regarding where this is going to finally take them when they walk across the stage. Does that make any sense, that question? Yeah, I think from a, from a teacher perspective, and we're trying to focus on addressing that through the professional learning, is at the beginning of the process with Empower, it was really focused on the entire tool. So if you think about the grading and feedback element and then the LMS, so that's where a lot of those technological features come in. It was what Jason would talk about, the old training was really overwhelm you. Yeah. And so what we have really focused on with this revamp and training is around the assessment, the instruction assessment practices and using the tool as a grade book to provide feedback. As we talk to teachers, they literally will take like a sigh of relief, like, wow, I can do that. Now, there, there's some instruction assessment practices that uh, we continue to work through, but from a technology perspective, when we focus on that feedback and reporting part, the learning curve is much, is, is not nearly as steep. And then we support them as they continue to use the system in introducing the LMS when they feel it's appropriate for them. That's really good to hear. Because the, whatever that training was that we had in the library here, in the library middle school, and blah, blah, whatever, that some of the, some of the folks that were involved from, from Chaska High School, the parents who were jobbed with coming back and reporting to the rest of the group, what did you learn, couldn't tell them. Because, again, I think they were just overwhelmed. So I'm very glad to hear that we're, we're breaking it down and, and maybe dealing more with where we see the fires, too. Mm -hmm. And I do think from a, a teacher and a parent perspective, I think it's, it's a new system. So they are used to the traditional system of you know, getting 90 out of 100 on the assessment, and that is 90%. So that kind of makes sense as to where they are at you know, relative to their experience. And so as we're shifting the conversation, not focused on points and a score, really focus around the learning and what that means, that takes some time to, to understand and to, to grasp. And I think to Lisa's point, I have, I have a young daughter in, in third grade, and the language that she speaks is around meeting learning targets. It's not about getting a 9 out of 10, but she's excited when she meets something and, and can articulate that. So I think that's probably the biggest piece that we see around that communication and understanding it. So I think that's where our where one of our greatest opportunities is, is to continue to, to communicate, but then to continue to to be responsive to having dialogue with folks when they have those questions, if it's a teacher, parent, student, and being open to that, to that conversation. It's the most natural reaction from all the constituencies if they don't understand anything is to not like it. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, it, it sounds like you're attacking it the right way. Okay. That's why. Thank you. You wrestle with this firsthand. Well, I don't know if this is the appropriate forum for this particular question, but I've I've heard from parents um, some confusion on the use of the term approaching it for the grading skill because there are t I mean approaching if you look at approaching basic meets succeeds approaching is like well you're kind of on the right track but you don't have kind of like that piece of the puzzle that means I get it at least at a basic level, but it's my understanding and I haven't seen it personally but I was my understanding that there are some courses where you'll have a learning target on the way to a powered standard that the highest thing you can get is approaching and that means well it's kind of just like a more minor part of a bigger thing. But, but when kids see approaching, they go, well, I don't, it means I don't get it. And so I think there's some confusion about how approaching can mean those two separate things. And if it's a concept that's worth grading, why isn't meets the thing that you should be able to get? And so that, I've heard that more than once. Thank you for that. And that's, we have as well. And that's feedback that we've received um, from parents and from students and from teachers. And that's part of the professional development and professional learning in our work with administrators and teachers is that we're focused on teaching to, to meet and extends, quite frankly, right? right? And so the approaching, we might, we might scaffold things and we might use the approaching language and the basic around formative assessments to get feedback as to where students are at to support them. But as we think about 
summative assessments and grading learning targets, we should be focused on the meets and giving kids the opportunity to extend when appropriate. So from, from our perspective, that's professional development that we need to continue to engage in. We had a conversation at yeah. the elementary principal meeting just last week around this same topic um, because I, I don't disagree with you that there is some confusion um, around that. Nomenclature is critical, especially with your rolling out something new. Yep, absolutely. And I think as we talk about the phase piece of once we get into that phase two and teachers are teaching and assessing before they're actually grading and empower, that's an important part of the professional development in the conversation that we are teaching and assessing to that meets and, and providing opportunities to extend. This is how we appropriately use the approaching and basic um, and then also, you know, providing feedback around that. So I'm kind of, I'm on two sides. Um, my kids right now are young, and so it's been fun to see them use some of the language um, through the standard-based learning. Part of, I think, and some of the concern that I've heard um, from from parents or even from teachers is, as we get to the, the secondary levels, and Jason, you talked a little bit about um, that, that letter grades are still being calculated. Some of my confusion or some of my questions are around how, how are we making sure that that's consistently calculated and how are parents brought into that conversation? And part of that is my kids are getting to the level where they're just getting into secondary and so trying to better understand that. But then also what happens, um, especially at the secondary level, if a student doesn't get to the, um, to the basic level? And so do they, do they then get a letter grade that would not be passing or do they get a, a, an incomplete or how does that process happen and how do we make sure that, that we're then intervening to get them to that level that they need to be at to move on to the next thing? Let me, uh, I'll talk about the first question first in terms of some of that consistency uh, of grading. So essentially as a teacher, I'm going through and I'm grading learning targets. I, when I grade my learning targets, I have an approaching, a basic, a meets, or an extends. So I have really four levels that I could be scoring at. Uh, from there, it, it really becomes then how much variability do we have amongst teachers. And I think that's where when we're seeing right now in the phase plan, that why we want teachers to be piloting and teaching and assessing to those standards before we actually report on them, is what we find out is the first time that teachers go through and usually write these power standards and learning targets, a lot of times it's about what I'm going to teach, not what I want my learners to learn. So when they come back and refresh, it takes a whole different mold as they're looking at it, and, and their mindset is all about their learners that, that second time, uh, which then the language becomes more student-friendly, and the conversation becomes very rich about what does this mean at a meets level. So they, they get very descriptive on some things, and they're even bringing back feedback that they're getting from their learners about, you know, this would be more learner-friendly if you said it this way. Uh, so that we can make sure that it's focused on our learner. So that, that helps us then with that variability, start to narrow that gap. And I think as we continue, we're going to have to continue to have some of those conversations around what does it look like to be at a meets level in one classroom versus another classroom. Uh, one of the things that I'm uh, excited about is the, the possibility of our data warehouse where we can then start to look at how are students being scored on their learning targets and what does that look like then when we go to MCA test scores. Are, do we have a strong correlation or is it a weak correlation? Uh, do we have one school that seems to be off? Why are they off? Is it because all of those teachers are thinking the meets level is something a little bit different than the other buildings? Uh, so that we can help then uh, identify some of those cracks, so to speak, that are going on with that learning and helping then help uh, and involve those people with trying to come up with some common knowledge around that crack so that we can then focus on it and make sure that we fix and we bring that variability down as we go through. In general, a teacher is going to score that learning target. Those learning targets are averaged then into a power standard score, which then get averaged into the course score. So teachers are really just scoring learning targets as they go through at one of those four levels. 
For a student at a secondary level, that if they have one learning target that's below a basic, our, our current model that we're working with is uh, we're looking at them then getting an incomplete or a not yet, which really means is that we, we have some, uh, st uh, some scaffolding to do with that particular student's learning to trying to make sure that they get that foundation. A basic level really means is that we're creating a strong foundation so that that learner can be successful when they go on to that next course within that sequence. So if we send them to that next course without that strong foundation, that's where we have concerns about are we just passing on future failure and future frustration for the learner as well. So how do we help that learner at that point? Uh, so this year, uh, we, we still had at a high school level your traditional summer school where students would take, retake the entire course, but we also had what was called summer standards attainment where students would, uh, if they were identified, as it's, this would be a useful avenue for them to be able to get to their learning. They would go through that and really work on those learning targets, just those targets that they weren't at least at a basic level at this point yet. So rather than taking the whole course, they're really just focused on those couple of targets that they're uh, working through to try to get to that basic level. And is that typically with the same instructor or teacher that, that they went through the, the semester or the course with, or is it with someone else, or how does that play out through the summer? I, I think a little of both. Uh, we do have some high school teachers that uh, would take on that work with their learner. They didn't want to send that learner uh, to a different teacher to complete that learning, so they just took that on and helped that learner get to at least that basic level. In other cases, we had students that were going to a different teacher. In many cases, if they would go to that different teacher, uh, that other teacher had access to what was the learning that they kind of went through the first time. So they were able to make some decisions, instructional decisions about do I have them just kind of redo or retake what they did before, or do I make some uh, adjustments instructionally and have them try something a little bit different to, try, to still get to that learning. So a student goes through, they take a course in the spring, they don't get to a basic, so they get an incomplete, and they decide not to do anything in the summer. What happens to them next fall? So what the, the high school administration had decided is that anybody with an incomplete that left it that way and didn't come through to take advantage of uh, some extended learning opportunities, that would then transfer into an F, which essentially would then uh, red flag for the student that I, if it was a required course, essentially they would have to retake that course then that next school year. And <clears throat> Ron, I just want to follow up on your your question, the first part of your question, because <clears throat> it's actually really interesting is um, as parents and teachers and, and students are asking for more um, understanding and clarity around how the grade is calculated and consistency around that, um, you know, kind of the interesting piece, and, and Jason can attest to this, in the, in the previous system, yes. so now we have, in the, so if you think of the back end of the system, there's one way to calculate it. Mm -hmm. it, they calculate those learning targets and it creates the grade. In the past, I don't even know if you could, what number would you give for the number right. of different ways to calculate a grade? Because every teacher could change the scales, they could change the weights, they could change the categories. Um, Fred, you could probably speak to this too. So there wasn't one way to calculate a grade. There were numerous ways. And so even just to help support <clears throat> teachers through an electronic grade book was <clears throat> really challenging, right? So for the first time, <clears throat> since I've been um, working with electronic and, 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 and that process, we have one system. So we're more consistent now than we've ever been before. Uh, but again, we still need to be able to communicate how that gets done. But the nice thing is that it is much more consistent than it's ever been in the past. And I I'd certainly appreciate that and I think that consistency is really important the concern that I have I think is that you know in the in the FAQs that we have we talk about um, that that we don't necessarily some of the teachers may not necessarily um, communicate what that letter grade is until the end of the course and for those parents who are used to that letter grade as as the standard or as the, how they can um, be able to reason how well their student is doing, if they don't have that knowledge until the end of the course, they may not um, 
kind of raise the level of concern that they have and maybe how they're going to get involved in their students learning um, and making sure that they're being successful. So I think that that's the, the challenge and the concern is how are we making sure that we are um, changing our communication as teachers in terms of how is that student doing in a way that they're going to understand. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, and that's. I think that's a challenge as well that we saw as a part. Uh, and this goes back even prior to Empower that we had some uh, standards-based pilots that were going on where they were waiting until you know two weeks left in the term to be able to actually score learning targets. Which and then it was like kind of this gotcha moment. All of a sudden, here's this grade. So I, I think what we have to do is help uh, support uh, some of those teachers and tell them that yeah, the first time that students go through and do some of these things, and you're summatively assessing them go ahead and score it and then communicate it as well and I think that's the part that and communicated is a part that uh, we've we've gotten a little bit too reliant on technology that we're letting the grade book do all of the communication that I think the grade book is just a piece of the communication it's very important that we're also communicating whether it's email phone calls uh, to letting parents know that hey we just did this project we just scored this learning target don't worry if your child is really low right now because we are going to assess this two more times yet this term and next time we'll be in four weeks when we do this project. Those types of communication I think help ease some of that uh, awareness uh, and, and by all means we don't want to create that got, those gotcha moments. We want to minimize those and really start to give that feedback more in real time to letting uh, parents and, and learners know this is where you're at right now. And there's definitely opportunity and time yet for you to be able to uh, achieve higher levels of learning. I think that's great. And I would say I, <clears throat> I appreciate that concern because I think in order for us to maximize a system, timely ongoing feedback is, is critical. So we can't wait until the end of a, a quarter or a semester or a year to be providing that feedback to our students and parents. So as we work with, with staff and professional learning, uh, that it it needs to be timely and ongoing and some expectations around that so we can build that partnership with our learners to support them moving forward. So thank you for that. I think one of the other things is with the standards-based learning, sometimes it's viewed a little bit as, you know, like, well, we'll grade it or provide you feedback when you've mastered it at the grade level end of the year expectation. And so many of the standards spiral and build on each other throughout the year. So I think part of it also is adding the language of your, this is where your child is at compared to what I would expect at this time. So if it's November, at this time, they're meeting that standard. We're going to come back three more times. And if they don't make the expected progress, they might be at a basic or they might continue to be at a meets. So I think it's really adding that language of this is where your learner is at on this standard at this time compared to what we would expect for the learning that's occurred. And that's a learning curve both for teachers and for parents to get used to. Thank you. I got a whole ton of questions, so. <laughs> I'm sure you do. You can go ahead. <laughs> okay. What's the, this black box? What is it? So there's, I mean, because Grading, I mean, your point, I mean, it's, there's consistency now. I don't park that for a second. But grading, what I always tell people is like, grading has been the wild, wild west forever. Right? Teacher A, hard curve. Teacher B, their own personal standards. Right? And everywhere in between. Teacher B, I'm going to grade you across, a curve across two sections. Teacher C, I'm going to grade you her curve on this classroom, right? What's your cohort, right? What are your learning targets? All these decisions have been made on the fly, not on the fly, but made, you know, pursuant to an individual teacher's view. We are trying to put some order into this chaos. It's been constructive chaos. It's the chaos we've known and loved and, you know, like a crazy aunt and uncle, but that doesn't make it, can't be better. So to me, I get it. It makes a ton of sense. One question I have, though, is kind of comes back to it is, 
we need to communicate. What is it? So, okay, they grade the targets, you know, approaching, approaching basic meets exceeds. How does that, is that, is that then calculated into, okay, so it's translated into a letter grade based on, you know, Susie or Jimmy's, right, relative, have they, they might have meets 20 learning targets. The next student might have exceeds for 10. Who's doing better? Who's doing better? What's your, what's your algorithm tell you? I mean, is that factored into it? Is it relative to the cohort, which is their classroom? Is it relative to the cohort, which is Eastern Carver County Schools? What is it? I think that's where we need to, I mean, that's, those are the questions that I jump to, right? Consistency is great, but we need to be able to clearly convey so it, it isn't a black box. Here's the standard, here it is. And then ultimately, right, we communicate, we can convey through progress and data, your kid, you know, your child is going to do better on whatever, you know, is if it's the ASVAB going in the military, if it's the ACT or whatever score, whatever test they're taking to further their life, right? That these standards align appropriately to that. And that's where we've got to get to. And we've got to, you know, sort of indulge. I mean, it sounds like, you know, we're working through that because we are on the forefront. We've, we know that we're on the forefront of all this stuff. So, I mean, that's, there's a few questions in there, a few comments, statements. It's a kind of potpourri. But anyway, um, but it's really important. What I am really was heartened to hear is that you're capturing a lot of feedback from a lot of people. Um, I know who's who's been Amy. Were you on the on the task? One of the yeah, the, Fred and I both were. You were okay. Mm -hmm. So you've been there. You've had I think pretty good engagement, and you know we're we're working through this. But you know I think the the process is right. Um, so bringing that all back, I think what we need to pe keep people focused on is we're not just building this thing to build something to do something different. We're trying to make it better, right? So what I think, what I focus people on is, you know, you're just, your whole way of navigating the system is, you know, get the teacher that you know how they grade, and then you work the teacher, you work their system, and then you got to work another teacher and work their system. We kind of, we, we streamline that a little bit. So that hopefully should be, you know, you know, it's different, but it should hopefully be easier for people. But I think communicating, you know, what it is is great, but how is it better relative to the old? I think, you know, put on the website is like how, comparing it. Here's the old world. Here's the new world. Here's why it's better. Because there's a lot of people that just like, it's different. I just, I don't like, don't like change. But go back to them, remind them, hey, going back a few years, you had that, you know, that crazy bird guy for history, right? And you just, Boy, you couldn't get anything above a B for him because he's a hard grader. So you tried to get into, you know, um, somebody else. I won't make class, and you could get a better grade, right? So we can eliminate some of that stuff. They, people forget that. I mean, we're, we have these, we're attached to these, you know, romantic notions of what worked for me, I'm great, it's all good. But you flip forward, I mean, I'm, I know we all go back. There was, you think about some of the frustrations you had with your grading experiences and it all boils down to there's probably a lack of consistency so hopefully this fix that so if we can communicate that I think that will help you us and everyone um, the uh, one of the things I um, the power standards and learning targets you talked about this completion what was that percentage you had the hundred mm -hmm. percent Jason you had up there what was that percentage referencing yeah, yeah there no, come, sorry, go back, go back. No, keep going. That one. Yeah. 100% complete. Is that just for yeah. the courses that those selected? The, are there more courses yeah. to then be incorporated? Yeah, good question. So for the courses that are at the elementary level, so there are 100 courses at the elementary level. 100% of those courses have power standards and learning targets developed. What we put here is just key focus for this particular year. We brought 43 of those 100 courses in. Which ultimately You're 100 now we're 100 completed on those 43. 100 percent completed overall with all overall. 100. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. So you but did this 43, 43 this just year, reflects the courses that we brought in. Yeah. So total, 
I could have, okay. we could have communicated that more effectively, but total we had 101 courses that came in for either development or refresh work throughout the course of the year. Got it. And this number breaks down which courses came in, and then this overall completion is how many of the 100 at elementary are completed 100%. 100, there's 100 courses total at middle school, 99% of them completed, and then we have 200 courses at the high school. Right. And 30% of those are Got it. completed. The, um, my next question related to that then is, I mean, my understanding talking to teachers is power standards learning targets are set, but you, I mean, you kind of alluded to it, right? You set them once, and you go back and, well, you set them based on, well, here's what I teach, right? You know, well, what do we want them to learn, right? And they figure it out. So what has the experience been now? How many iterations, I mean, once you... Once you set them the first time, how many? How long does it take for them for them to get stabilized, or do you not even know yet? Is it still too early? Can you give me some sense of how that process? Because it doesn't sound like it's like a one and done type of a process, right? Our, our goal would be that they would come to the table two times before going into phase three, so they would have that first year to develop. So they go through and they articulate what they believe would be their power centers and learning targets. Then they would teach and assess to them. They would come back to the table that spring based on what they learned. Then they would go through that refresh process and then migrate into phase three mm -hmm. the following year. I think what we have learned through the process <coughs> and just looking and having conversations with teachers K through 12 is what, to Jason's point. I think at the beginning of time, we were articulating power standard, power standard and learning targets through an instructional lens. And we should really, we really need to be articulating them through an assessment lens. These are the items that I, as an instructor, need to assess students and get feedback on so we can make sure that they're making progress towards their standards. You're going to teach that a, a number of different ways. So at the beginning, you may have heard feedback from a teacher saying that we just have way too many learning targets. And typically when a, a course there are way too many learning targets, it was through, I need to teach all of these things, but then in this system, now I have to assess all of this, and I, I can't possibly formally assess or summatively assess this. So we're really, we're, we've really grown in that professional development, working with teams to have a really clear process of how to unpack standards appropriately, learning targets. So we, I think our, our first, now our first iteration, we're just much more effective, and we have so many more teachers that have gone through the process that understand it too. And it's not just the teachers getting better at the process, it's us as a um, teaching and learning yeah, team sure. getting better yeah. at guiding and supporting yep. them yep. to do the work. And the so instructional coaches, learning, coach learning yep, everyone's, yep. 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 The conversations are just much different now than they were. I've got to believe ago. immensely. Yep. I think that process is always going to be ongoing too, just as as teachers, so they've, they've made this kind of first movement into this. Um, and based on how they've taught it and frustrations with Empower or maybe how students received it, they've made some adjustments. And <clears throat> But as the other piece is, as we continue to use data to look at how our kids performing, then that causes them to go back and say, you know what, in this area, we're really not doing as well as we need to. Let's look at these particular learning targets and make adjustments. So it always needs to be kind of that dynamic process ongoing and as new knowledge and new things come in. Um, so I think that that should be kind of an ongoing um, work that gets done. But what I will say, um, <clears throat> and even outside people who come in and work with our teachers, because they're doing this process, because they're, they're standards-based, they're teaching to standards, and <clears throat> they're really embedded in professional development with the standards, our teachers know those standards like never before. And, and I know, again, those outside professionals that come in and work with our teachers, they are always really impressed with the knowledge level. And, and before, <clears throat> there was a lot of standards, and, and you know, you did kind of what we call standards aligned, where the textbook says, the company says it's aligned to standards, and if I teach this stuff, theoretically they get it, right? Um, and that's different from really teaching to the standards and being very purposeful and uh, ensuring there's clarity around those things. So I think it's, again, it's hard work, but I think it's been a benefit to our teachers and their knowledge level of what they bring to the classroom. I mean, I, I, I am continually struck by the amount of heavy lifting you know, our teachers are doing with this stuff. I mean, Chris's constituents back there, 
I mean, you know, they have to go from, well, I got a textbook. I know generally they get through this textbook, they'll, you know, they'll be good with sixth grade, you know, math, right? Now we've asked them basically, now you got to get down these, these questions are going to this standard, this standard, this standard. They're really having to get to a, a deeper level of um, understanding of what they're doing. Um, and so a lot of strain on the whole system, right? You guys, the instructional coaches, everyone. So I think I, that, that's just a reminder for all of us. This is hard stuff. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, we are, you know, I think, I can't remember who, you know, years, you know, it's kind of a little bit about, you know, we're changing parts on an airliner, right? And hopefully we're not changing the engine. Um, we're doing that on the ground. But, you know, in the air, you know, maybe we're, you know, we're changing more or less, less mission critical systems. But anyway, um, I think that's just kind of something, an observation. Um, <coughs> with the changes for Empower, based on the feedback you've gotten, and again, I think the feedback is getting more informed as everyone's learning, right? Where do you think, and this is a kind of a higher level question, but um, based on the feedback you've gotten, how well do you think you're going to meet people's needs this coming year in terms of you know, you know their user experience with Empower? I, I think with students, uh, we are the feedback that we've gotten. I, I was able to actually show when we uh, in the spring when we were able to pull in teachers and students in a collective group to gather feedback from them. We were actually able to show them that mock-up that I showed you, and got feedback directly from them at that point. And overwhelmingly, students were already shaking their heads, going, "Yes, this answers the clickiness thing," and that and that was one of the one of their main points about the system was the clickiness. So they, they were very appreciative of that. And then, as we looked at it, that's where the ideas of can my teacher pin it for me? <laughs> Do I have to always pin it? So those things started to bubble up from there that we were able to share with Empower and get implemented. So I, I'm very uh, hopeful on in terms of the student interface that it's, it's going to answer a lot of their common questions that were systems related. Um, and then from a parent perspective, uh, I, I think in terms of what we were hearing constant feedback from, in terms of I want to see what was just scored that, that, kept, that kept being a theme that we were hearing from parents that I think with that uh, workbook feature uh, that we'll be able to deliver with uh, something that will help them as well. The progress side of it. Yeah, that. I think we, we ran a lot of what if scenarios by parents as we would speak to them and, mm -hmm. and be having, and having conversations as well as teachers around the parent workbook. What if we could create a system and empower that had some elements that look like what you are familiar with in Portal? How would, how would that be received? And, Overwhelmingly, the feedback was, yes, that would be a great thing because we understand that. So as we worked with Empower to develop that, we've had that in mind. And it will have some other features and filters that I think will just enhance that user friendliness from a parent perspective. So we're, we're confident that, uh, and, and I think our, our uh, work ahead of us is really that communication piece. How can, how can you now, we have this feature, how can you effectively use it to understand where right. your student is as a learner? Because that's where I was and going so, to. I mean, the students yep. will, you know, they live and breathe yep. this, so they'll learn it, you know, just by doing. Yep. You know, the parents, they got a million other things going on. They just want to check on, you know, how, how's my child doing? And it's like, oh, I got this new system. How do I do this? And they're pulling their hair out. How do you make that easier? Yeah, and I think that's a communication part on what we've talked about at all levels, part of our upcoming training with teachers and professional development is, and I spoke to this a little bit before, is we believe the most effective means of communication is through the teacher. So when it's timely for a student. So if they grade a learning target, sending out specific information of it, just learn this, I, we just, I just graded this learning target, here's the video to go and access it. So it's very timely, it's in front of them. Yeah, I mean, building that relationship. because. What we find is when we send out communication, Jason and myself, I mean, I think we're pretty fun to talk to, but not very many people actually probably look at it because they don't know who we are. But when, when it's the teacher and it's really timely and it's around the learning that their student and the grading of their student at that moment in time, I think we have a better opportunity to capture them. Well, I mean, I really encourage you to, I mean, to the extent you can do it, to the extent the Empower yeah. team can do it, creating, you know, little instructional videos. Because the last, you know, we, we can't add tier one tech support to these poor teachers. 
Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they should just be passing on a link and, yeah, and trying to like for them. We got to sit absolutely. down. Well, you got to log in. You got to click on that. Click on that. I mean, that's yep. That's absolutely. And I think we'd like to even take it a step further to say, here's a sample piece of communication that you might want to send out the first time you Smart. score a learning target. Right. And here are the directions that will help your parents. But I, I, I think even to help. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Berg, even to help some of our technology uh, challenged uh, users, we want to be able to offer opportunities for them as well. I, I don't know if Fred <clears throat> takes umbrage, but I, on behalf of him, take umbrage. <laughs> <laughs> so I think one, one of the things we want to continue to offer is our digital learning coaches being there to support uh, during conference nights so that the teacher can focus on the learning when they're conferencing with a parent and a parent can go somewhere else if they have questions about the system. Or do we offer things like webinars that parents parents can log into to ask questions, or do we offer uh, parent academy nights where we might be at certain buildings that parents can come in and really ask some of those questions more one-on-one -on -one to help support them with uh, trying to figure out where their learners are at and how they can support them. Great. I think another area of frustration for students that <clears throat> we, and I know, you know, Jason and Chris continue to work on with Empower that they've been a little resistant to, I don't know what these newest versions will be like, is they don't, there isn't really a, um, an app version of Empower, right? So kids like with Infinite Campus, they have the Infinite Campus app, they, they push the button and then their grades come up and they get that quick snapshot. So I know we've, we've heard a lot about it's not really mobile friendly. Mobile, yeah. and, and I know you guys have continued to push back on that. Again, I don't know what the new, you know, whether any of those new adjustments will work any better, but you know, those are things we'll continue to talk about. Even if there are ways, you know, we've got some pretty talented staff here, you know, could we create our own app somehow and um, some some workarounds for that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's an, you know, definitely something that we need to get to. But, I mean, they all have Chromebooks. They can go to a, you know, they can go to a, a URL and, you know, it can use a web, I mean, for now. I mean, that, that we need to get to a I mobile. I just know that's been consistent complaint yeah. that we've heard from kids is I just want to I, I right. do everything with my phone I just want to see where that yeah. right. parents also are asking for that as well so we're continually providing that feedback to empower and yeah, they're not there yet but right we'll keep working on it because <laughs> <laughs> mobile apps are, are cheap to develop they're just um, I do it in HTML5 I wouldn't do a separate app but anyway that's my own oh, thoughts um, communication, you've already done, I just can't encourage you enough to work on communication because that, you know, the more effective we are at, at the communication, it'll make everyone's life easier, everyone here. So, um, I've got a bunch of other questions, but I've exhausted, I think, everyone's intent. So, I'll just get it. I mean, great comments around the, the whole board table, I think. I'd, just to kind of summarize a little bit, I think. You know, the clear thing is communication, communication, communication. Mm -hmm. I mean, the level of questions that you see up here, we've got those. The community got has those as well. I, I think some of the key aspects, right, is this is heavy lifting. The reason the teachers are stepping up for it in the district and why we're committed to it is because it is better, right? It, it's better for the student in the end of how to move them forward. But you got to be able to communicate on how that grade goes. You can you hear that theme over and over again. How does this connect to a grade? We got to figure out how to communicate that out, um, and how that and how that is no worse, right? It's at least as good as what their experience is today, and most likely better, right? Especially, you know, from a day-to-day -day experience, and then from an ultimate, you know, academic success. Yeah, I like your point, Tim, of that old versus new. You know, here's the old system, here's right. the, and then here's the new system on, you know, why this is better and the improvement. I think, you know, to end, because, uh, again, a lot of good discussion in terms of that is this is a journey, right? And, and along the way, this is how that improvement takes place and understanding how this <laughs> continues to build. is great to see that interface change and to take that feedback. But you, one of the biggest challenges we're going to continue to have is how do you overcome those first impressions, right? And some of those impressions, you can hear them, they're already ingrained out there. Yep. And you've addressed those, but we gotta figure out how we communicate that and get that engagement back. Because you, you gotta help that group too, because that's gonna be a sticking point other, otherwise of how to get them back engaged and show them that this is better now. Sure. That's a good point, thank you. Yeah. Because how many times have we heard about that two classrooms, right? That this first 
some of the, I mean, that still sticks, that stigma still out there and to overcome that. Absolutely. Anything else? Thank you, Jason, thank you. Chris, Amy, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are on to item 5.3, superintendent's evaluation. Um, so I'll set the stage and turn it off to, to Jeff. We had a, uh, I think, a, a very fulsome discussion, uh, very constructive discussion um, on Clint's first year, and I think a very successful year. Um, but being greedy, we're always looking for ways to, um, to do even better um, by our kids, and I know Clint wants that as well. So, um, but uh, suffice to say, you know, we're very, we're very happy um, with the progress you've made with the team that you're bringing on here and, and uh, encouraged by the, the things that are ahead of us. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff for some color on the details. Sure, and, and the evaluation was kind of broken down into four different key areas. Uh, exceptional personalized learning and some targets that were specifically in that, creating a climate of safe and nurturing environment, um, prudent management of public resources, and culture of communication. Um, overall, the summary that we provided back to Clint was in line with uh, what Tim just mentioned, and that is over the last 12 months, Clint has demonstrated his ability to be an effective superintendent and his ability to build a strong district and environment for students, faculty, and staff. During this time, he managed a um, major capital plan, continued to bring forward the personalized learning plan, and promoted communication within the district. And then we broke, that's the overall, and then really broke out into the individual ones um, achieving the goals. And as we looked at exceptional personalized learning, uh, we felt that this is a core strength of Clint's uh, and, and an area that he achieved the defined goals well. And we continue to look for the momentum going forward in this area. Safe and nurturing environment, again, Clint's done a great job in achieving the goals that were defined in this area. Um, and the work around equity is, is going well. When we look at prudent management of resources, uh, we felt that this was a great job too with him and, and the whole uh, senior team. Um, if we look at where we are with budgets, managing those, those capital bills, and overall communicating this back to uh, the overall community. We saw just a couple weeks ago the whole uh, budget or audit. Uh, and the level of detail that goes into that to show how our resources are being managed and how this is going forward. And just the overall culture of communication, I think you could see it tonight, the depth and other things of the reports that come forward and the level of discussion. Um, done a good job on hitting those targets and really bringing that forward and creating that culture of accountability and communication in the district. So that was our assessment uh, and evaluation of, for our superintendent. And just as context, there was no, as you recall, there is no incentive plan in, in for this year, so we we didn't, uh, uh, obviously there wasn't a need to, to, as we've done in the past, to take this and to quantify it and, and turn it into a, a, a performance bonus um, decision. So it was, it was a, a good qualitative discussion. And uh, again, uh, um, uh, I think you know we're very happy and we're very fortunate to have you uh, leading the ship. And anybody else want to any other two cents, twenty five cents, dollars? Okay, great. Well, thank you, and let's keep it up. Um, so with that, we'll go to communication from the school board uh, six point one. So Ron, anything? I don't have anything. Okay. I attended the District 112 Foundation meeting this evening. Um, we have had a turnover of officers. Um, Adam Farm, Chris Reinecke, and Nadia Jansen, who were respectively the chair, treasurer, and secretary, have moved on to other um, pursuits, and so we are sad to see them go, but um, the board voted tonight to have Angela Erickson as the new chair, Jason Vanderskoff as the new treasurer, and Mike Fahey as the new secretary, and we assume that they will, I believe, carry on the... Uh, good name of their predecessors, and we're happy that they have stepped up to help the foundation be successful going forward. Thank you for being a part of that. I have no report. Fred? Nothing, thanks. And I do not have a report either, so I will turn it over to 6.2.
Clint? Just a, a couple quick things. One, um, <clears throat> you know, again, you approved uh, Gretchen Kleinsaucer tonight as the new principal for La Academia, and we finished that process up last week. And <clears throat> again, just um, always impressed as we move through that process the great um, candidates that we get, um, and impressed with how we, you know, kind of really ensure that um, we we go through a, a very rigid process to to ensure we, we get the best match for the building. But <clears throat> beyond that, we, we include students in this process. Um, <clears throat> it looks a little bit different at the elementary than it does at maybe high school and middle school. We don't always include them at the, the large group interview, but we always include them as a part of leading the tour at the building, and they do ask questions and we get their feedback. So even at the elementary level, we're getting feedback from kids. And I just wanna say how impressive at all levels, elementary, middle school, and high school, when you look at the feedback they get from the feedback we get from the other groups, and you see the alignment. They're so perceptive um, and just brought, provide a great context for us. So um, again, it was just, it was another great process to go through and, and um, looking forward to uh, continued great things at La Academia with Gretchen at the helm. Also at your, um, at each of your spots there, you have a school board assignment. Um, we do kind of review those each year. <clears throat> so please contact me if you, you think there needs to be a change. With a board election in November, typically what we do is kind of just hold tight on what we've got, see where we end up after the election, and, and then as we come back in um, December and January, if we need to make adjustments, we will at that time. So if there's something really pressing that we, we need to make some switches on, please let me know. Otherwise, we'll just stay status quo until we get further into the year. Great. Okay. Okay. With that, we are adjourned. Thank you.